How's it going, everybody? I'm gonna get started in a second here. Let me just adjust the, the audio. It's good to see everyone. Daul, Shades of Orange, Black Ruku. So we got uh, Jabraham. Is that Jacob? We have um, some new, some channel updates here. So if you go to johncoons.com slash live. Oh, Jeff, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so if you go to the, any anywhere you see the channel or whatever, um, I updated my channel points. So we now have VDB style voxels. Um, subscribers, they have, we have a Kim emote. <laughs> so we got uh, is Kim Davidson, the CEO or, or fa founder and, and head of side effects. Um, and then the solver, the brain. So I think, um, <laughs> so I think you have to be maybe subscribed to, to be able to access them. Thanks to everyone that's subscribed and supporting and everything like that. It's, it helps, uh, I can spend more time doing this kind of stuff and uh, everyone gets uh, kind of benefits from it. So I spend more time and the content gets better, the, the community gets bigger and everyone has more fun. Um, if you are, if you're not subscribed and you have like Amazon Prime, you can link it up and just use, link it up like that and it will be, uh, you don't have to pay anything. It just takes money from Jeff Bezos and gives it to me essentially. <laughs> so that's a fun thing uh, to do as well. Uh, so I'll continue to mess around with the emotes or change them or whatever and uh, we'll see what happens. Um, so that's an update. Thanks to all the, um, everyone that had originally subscribed to the new subscribers. Um, I also went through with the YouTube channel. How are you cheating with the, uh, the emotes? <laughs> so with the, um, my YouTube channel, I went through and just tried to grab like thumbnails, um, that were a little bit more, <laughs> these were a little bit more pleasing. So I also have, um, these, uh, BT TV emotes or whatever. Um, so these will show up. I don't think they show up in the Twitch chat or whatever, but they will show up in the chat arena. It's like third party, um, third party emotes or whatever. <laughs> yeah, so we have uh, those that you can play around with too. <laughs> so um, thanks for the uh, Twitch Prime sub, Skidviz. Skidviz. So we have, I just added thumbnails to kind of make this a little bit easier to keep track of. It was just like auto automatically grabbing them or whatever and they weren't the most, uh, illustrative before um so so that's that's an update if you go through all the the most of the older streams and archive and stuff like that is is on youtube um and then i was playing around with like last friday's or last week's um grain simulation the head thing so i flipped it around i think it, it works a little bit better um the cool zone. <laughs> Good to see you, Alex. So I think um, it was looking a little bit better uh, oriented falling down like that. Um, when I was like laying it down flat, like you're dunking a, a child being born or something like that. It uh, just seemed to be like everything was everything was crumbling at once and it just wasn't as interesting as like uh, an animation or um, Visually, it just looked, it, it was harder to tell what's going on. So I think this is a little bit cooler doing it like super slow motion, this crack. Yeah, the forehead has <laughs> worked out pretty well with that. Um, I might try a, a little bit higher resolution. I think this was like 15, 
million or 20 million, somewhere around there. Um, I might try a little bit more, but I think it's going to be cool, if, like just having variation in the, the composition with like a diffuse pile, very, uh, very like blurry kind of spread or whatever, and then this sharp, crisp uh, form or whatever for cracked, cracked head. He's, he got a migraine headache or something like that. Um, so I guess we can, just gonna get rid of this music. I'm gonna try today without music. We'll uh, see how it goes. See, it usually keeps me focused, but I think, some, I don't know, sometimes in the VODs it gets a bit distracting. So I might just switch back and forth and I don't know, we'll see if we, we keep it or not. Um, so maybe I'll give people a little bit, a few more minutes to get in, just, just in case people are running late. Uh, there was one, there was this um, breakdown we could watch. Art directing sequence. Compositors were given a full complement of lighting, utility, this and is, in order This is like from the new Godzilla movie or whatever. Uh, Dean Egg posted this comp, and then there's some, some visual effects breakdown and stuff at the end. So just let this play or whatever. And we'll get started in like five minutes or so with the, the Houdini, the proper cool zone. To sculpt shots using light and shadows. This emphasized the vastness of the environment and guided the viewer's eyes to areas of interest. Comp also pushed the idea of scale in most shots, adding layers of atmosphere, as well as simplifying shapes to create silhouettes, which helped sell depth. In addition, practical elements and nuke-generated particles were added to enhance already impressive FX renders and give shots more grit and realism. In some occasions, Comp orchestrated the timing of interactive elements to bring full CG shots to life. An example would be revealing Ghidorah's silhouette from within a supercell, driven by lightning strikes, using a combination of lighting, FX, and DMP. On other occasions, Comp had to fake in light sources while trying to maintain photo. Comp makes the shot look better. To tell the story. This was created by relighting the CG using carefully placed animated mats generated from utility passes, projections, or just simple rotor shifts. In shots where creatures were involved, Comp tried to keep the emphasis on the gigantic beasts and tried to set them in an environment that supports their scale. Ooh. <laughs> this meant dialing the atmospheric... What's happening there? You guys see that? Oh, <laughs> they didn't run enough collision passes or something. It was like the same issues I was having in one of the streams, like the the collision, the proxy geometry and stuff like that doesn't uh, represent the shape perfectly or something. But you could, this is a good breakdown because you see like the effects result is pretty jittery, but then the comp comes in and just does atmosphere dust, more dust, more dust, more dust until you can't really notice the uh the jittery the jittery stuff or whatever <laughs> but yeah i think i don't know the, the, overall it's pretty cool i imagine maybe just like the bandwidth of the work got a little bit too high um for them and that's that's how some of those the blast transform what did, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the blast transform workflow is you, you're just talking about like one of these uh reverse shockwave things. But overall, I think there's there's some really cool stuff that like Supercell, um, this thing turned out pretty interesting. It's always pretty pretty difficult to work with like a lot of volumes and uh, and get them working nicely and everything like that. Jabraham, Jeff, thank you for the Twitch Prime. Um, the other thing I noticed was like this, this one lava kick right here seems a bit, out of scale, like it's quite a big strand for um, for the, for a small little guy like that. Um, but it, I don't know. That could have been a <clears throat> just a creative note or something. It's not super like it's not a mistake necessarily. It's just a individual thing that I <laughs> take issue with. 
So it seems like the flip solver with Houdini, especially with surface tension and stuff, you tend to get Mr. Wazo. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> the uh, flip solver with Houdini tends to to, to generate those uh, long, like it's kind of like boogers or like saliva hanging out of people's nose or, or mouth or something like that. <laughs> it's a bit. It's a bit odd. I'm afraid to rely so much on posts. I feel like I trap myself if I can't repair a render with Compton, any thoughts? Uh, it just depends on your workflow. I think now it's getting a lot nicer with, with Redshift and uh, Octane. And I think V-Ray has some stuff too, where like they have the um, the render buffer that you can do like tone mapping and you can add some some subtle post effects like the glow and uh, atmos like even doing atmosphere and fog and stuff in, in render, it gets a lot easier. Um, it's the best idea to to get as, as far as you can in CG um, before you start faking stuff in comp, just because then like reflections, like everything will look accurate and it's just less less hacks and stuff like that. Um, but knowing comp and, and being able to do that, like if you're tweaking stuff super, super quick or whatever, you can uh, just have more like real time feedback and, and get a better result. So I think I don't know where I put it, but it might just be part of this. Um, <clears throat> like with this, with this, uh, this might be a bit loud. With this one, I faked a lot of it in, uh, in comp in terms of like all the passes and stuff I had split out. Like this was my, um, beauty render or whatever <laughs> this, is, <laughs> this is 2014 it's 80s music extra based deep fried and based um this is my beauty render and then this was comp uh this was just the flip solver this was like houdini 12.5 or something when they first before that you had to compile the ocean toolkit it was just called the hot or houdini ocean toolkit um and then this was the first time side effects added like the ocean toolkit or the ocean spectrum and all of those workflows. Um, so I was doing, this is when I was interning at side effects a while back. Lotsky, thanks for the Twitch Prime. Um, so you can kind of see the different layers. Like what I ended up doing even right here was doing uh, say like rendering out the Y position or the height of the, the ocean as um, an AOV and then using that to drive like a hue rotation so that higher peaks of the waves start to become like a lighter green, like there's more light passing through it. Um, it, it would be better to get that data in, in the actual, like you to have a volume or something happening under the water that would be doing that absorption and attenuation and stuff like that. But, um, it's because like if the if i like these reflections the boat I, I didn't do that good job rendering it but like if you could see the water in that reflection doing all this stuff in comp you might not see those uh color changes and stuff like that yeah so it's it just depends like how how much you want to rely on certain things and then i don't know i could have there's other things i could have done better just overall in terms of the project and everything but um this was something I probably relied too much on like post and, and that kind of stuff and just adding depth of field, but it was a uh, older, in, in older era where <laughs> you didn't have access to GPU renders and um, all of that stuff. So it was a bit, um, just a bit more, more difficult, but I found, I don't know, it just, it's a changing workflow or whatever, just cause the technology and everything like that is, um, always becoming newer and, and better and stuff like that. So just as a general rule, skid vids, you're gifting. Thank you. Thank you. I don't even know what's, I don't even know what's going on anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm still figuring out what's going on with Twitch. Um, but yeah, so, so just doing everything you can kind of in camera is the best way to do it. And then even like a visual, a visual effects supervisor working on set would have that same advice where doing filming things like a practical 
uh, affect anything of that lighting and, and blurring, like uh, bounce lighting and, and all that stuff will look better when it's actually happening instead of green screening and, and doing all that stuff. But knowing comp and, and being able to do that or just cropping things, like being able to, to edit and just sell your, your work as like a designer or whatever, that is a super good skill and goes a long way. So we'll get going with the uh, Houdini. Got some people in here. Hope everyone's having a good Friday, Juneteenth. The freedom, freedom for everyone, event one day, eventually. <laughs> so just gonna start with this Taurus. Um, I don't, I have some, some rough ideas for what I want to make today. It's, it's mainly going to be playing around with noise, um, and VDBs and kind of compositing them together and stuff like that. Um, so my idea right now is to kind of, so this, every Friday we do like a, um, just kind of daily art or sketch or something like that. Um, and that you would see the previous ones in, in the YouTube. Um, I've never midsummer in Sweden. <laughs> Happy midsummer. Hopefully it doesn't turn out like the, uh, the Ari Aster movie. Um, so what I'm going to try to do here is, um, just get wrangle that Taurus. <laughs> Hold on a second. Let me. I think my, my audio might be clipping a little bit. All right, let's try that. So um, yeah, so I have some ideas for, for noises. Um, I just want to try to create something kind of uh, interesting noise pattern, essentially. So just going to subdivide to add resolution. Um, and then start with a scatter. Rakesh, how's it going? I'm gonna turn off the other stuff, um, just so it's like a somewhat random distribution. And then I'm just gonna copy um, to points. Do a, a box and then merge them all together. So we have some, some issues here. Um, I'm not using the very latest build. I'm using 18.0.416. Uh, um, I did see that, that they had the 499 release come out that had some new features and stuff. I don't know because that I guess they don't have it yet. But the, the, the topo transfer stuff that should be pretty cool. And then the, um, what is it? There was like a path deformer. <laughs> but um, the path deformer, I'm super excited to, to try out. It's like something that every 3D software should have out of the box. Yeah, the OpenGL fog, <laughs> it should be, uh, we'll see how, how well it works. <laughs> it's like from, so the, for the a feature that they had in Bryce 20 years ago, they finally implemented it in, in uh, side effects in Houdini. So this right now you see this dark because um, you, the main giveaway is this exclamation point right here. And it's saying a mismatch of attributes, some attributes values may not be initialized to expected values, IE N. So it's this normal, doesn't exist on the torus, uh, so it's not being initialized properly. So I just add a normal there. Uh, initialized just means like created or set up for the first time um, generated. So now we have normals on both uh, our objects. Um, and then I'll just go to work with these randomizes. So if you guys ever use the, so people don't, don't uh, bust open the docs too much. But this attribute randomize, I've found that it, um, this is like one of the most useful documentation pages and stuff like that. Brando, how's it going? We got new, new emotes for you to try, Brando. We got uh, the Kim, we got the brain, the brain zone. 
Um, I don't know why I can't see my, my windows over here a bit messed up. There it is. That's, that was uh, Kim when he, when he saw the OpenGL fog for the first time. So this um, attribute randomize, like the documentation, this one, they actually have a ton of pictures and stuff like that. Uh, that super makes things like a lot more clear or whatever to, to read. Um, so it's, a, it's one of the only like really nice documentation pages I recommend. These distribution values are a bit hard to know what's going on without their little like diagrams are super useful. Um, so I'm just going to use this to do a P scale. Let's do this ramp. The ramp is always shades of orange. Thanks for subscribing. Uh, the ramp is always pretty nice just because you can like, this is basically saying make my own distribution by hand. The other ones are using kind of analytic math functions or stuff like that, like equations to do distributions. This ramp you just is more art directable or whatever, I guess. Um, you can as well. Another nice thing is if you just do output attributes on the scatter node, you can record a P scale with this that um, will change based on how many you're, you're putting in. And with the relax iterations, you can get like basically no, no penetrations or whatever. This is a, another, it's kind of hidden on the, the other tab of the scatter node. Um, can you add a scatter to like a cube and then use a randomized to adjust position of the individual points? Do you mean the individual points of the cube that are, that's being copied? You can do anything, <laughs> you can do it all. So there's a few different things, like you could do a jitter <clears throat> here and then do, um, we're basically scattering like a little diamond or, or shard or something like that. Um, you can also do it at the very end and then all of these, <clears throat> all of these things will be slightly uh, interesting, slightly perturbed or whatever. That's, a, that's another cool thing to do. Um, and then if we want like even more variation, we can do another randomization, this time do N, um, and then do direction or orientation. And then this one as well, you can do some things to, to customize it, like have them biased or basically tending towards a certain uh, rotation, which is pretty nice. This is the, no, this isn't going to be a blender. I saw they, they made the blender donut. Um, I'm just starting from, from the Taurus, but I'm, it's not going to be sprinkles. Um, I might, I want it to be a little bit more like rocks or like a cloud or something like that. Um, I might actually try a file. Let me see. I think it's going to be more, more interesting with like a custom uh, geometry. So <clears throat> I'm going to go to our favorite 3D scans, Andrew Coons. <laughs> this is the, uh, he's the blender guru. That, oh, thank you for the uh, tier one. Um, so I'm just going to look for, I thought they had some, some skulls or something like that. I think they have, they have like the guy holding up the, the apple or something like that. Where did he go? There it is. So I'm just going to steal the, the skull from that. We'll just put it in the downloads. So it's, it's nice that they always like show the example work or whatever, the derivative work from, from the scan. This is, yeah, this is a very, <laughs> this is a fine one to use. Um, so let's, uh, let's load this one up. 
sometimes uh, using the terminal or whatever, I'll just drag and drop my file into there to get the path. Found a new home. <laughs> so I, mean, I just want to steal his, his skull or the top of his head. So I just usually do match size. Um, this is just a quick way to kind of unitize, like make sure you know what, what scale things are coming in at. Uh, you can see this is coming from a different software. It's the meters and the units and stuff like that are pretty weird. So it's like um, 2000 meters tall, which is way too big. Cause then if I do remash or VDB from polygons or stuff like that, that's based, those operations are based on scale. It will like crash my Houdini. Um, so I'll just do the clip. This is a quick way to saw things off. Um, download more RAM. <laughs> I did, well, one thing I did was I actually downloaded another GPU. So, cause uh, the like Redshift was causing me to drop frames and stuff like that. Um, what I, what I did was I took a, a GPU out of another farm computer that I had. So um, now I'm using this Quadro RTX. I just have it set up with um, the preferences. So OpenCL uses the GPU and it will always use this Quadro RTX. Uh, and then the display or viewport for Houdini, um, my monitors are hooked up to this. GTX 1070 or whatever. So no more, hopefully no more sluggish frame rates. So it looks like I just need to go a little bit lower with this one. Um, you can, this sometimes this clip node is a little bit hard to to control completely. It seems like it's a little bit, it's a little bit slow just working with him. So I'm just gonna scatter points and then I can move it around uh, automatically. Something you do is at the bottom right. What is the unconnected points? So I'll just try this. Jim Johnson, how's it going? Johnston. You can choose to cook on mouse. Yeah, sometimes I do that. Um, it seems to be a bit of a pain to like always, I don't know, it's too far for you to move, to move the mouse on and off all the time. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a helpful tip. All right, so now I can just disable that match size. We're pretty good. I might, I'm just gonna clean up that collarbone a little bit. This is like super uh, getting into super OCD territory now. Just trying to, to save his chin. I think we're good. Let's see what happens. All right, that's, that's good enough for now. Um, and then going to, to VDB, like I'm gonna convert this to be a solid shape. Um, so I just usually do this cap, poly cap. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it has problems and maybe you want to switch to like quadrilaterals. It looks like that isn't working that well. Um, sometimes you have to do triangles with this kind of connectivity or whatever. Um, sometimes you just have to change it or whatever if it's not working with the default setting. And then 
just do a VDB from polygons. And maybe before I do that, I'm going to do another unit size. So this time he uh, just the, the head will not be scaled to like a unit. And then if I really want to, um, I might quickly do a, just try to get him like lined up along an axis. So sometimes I do more than one transform node or whatever, just so like the gizmo will get realigned. All right, we're good. So let's try still pretty low resolution. Let's try to put him onto the uh, donut. Skeleton donut. I'm going to undo that jitter for now. Maybe my P scale. Whoops, this is the normal. So in this um, scatter node, they have a scale radi radii by. Um, I can just use that to pump up the. Uh, you can copy VDBs like this, it's, it's, it's not the best idea. Um, it's it's not the best idea because if you middle mouse on it, somehow my what was it? Someone gave me the tip last time. What was it like? Alt, alt left control middle mouse or something to get the uh, node information to pop up. Um, you see, I have like four hundred and control middle. All right, thank you. So. Um, 473 total VDBs, like all of these are separate grids or separate um, transforms. Um, so you have to be a bit careful with that. Uh, so one thing you can do if you want, this is like a, a bit of a weird wiring technique. It's, it's kind of fancy. It's, a, it's, a, it's another uh, cheat code. So you do this and just do split zero to keep one of them, and then I have the other like 500 grids in this other input. And then if I just do, <laughs> here it comes, if I just do combine, um, set this to SDF union, and then um, flatten all B grids into first A input. It's a little slow to do this step, but um, what this does is flattens everything down into into one grid. So it's like if you if you're imagining um, twenty or like having five hundred different textures that are all acting like decals or something like that, and then you flatten them all down into one uh, volume or one grid. That's one way to do it. Um, there's another. Looks like this is my my computer is really struggling with this. <laughs> Uh, you can pack VDBs, but again, like, I don't know how much of an advantage there is to that because you're still dealing with uh, a bunch of different grids and stuff like that. Um, and I think with, I don't know if the, the renderers, they tend not to, I'm just going to stop that for a second. Um, I might just have to. I'm just going to try doing this at a, dip, at a higher resolution. Um, a lot of renderers have problems tracing through like a lot of overlapping volumes. So sometimes flattening everything into into a single volume will be better. So now you can see I'm it's here into uh, into a single volume, and then I think because this wireframe is like aligns like that, that just means that um, you might want to like reset maybe the, because there might be like a transform on the voxels, it, it seems like. Um, sometimes you can do it using that, or sometimes you can basically, this is like resampling everything into a new VDB. 
so sometimes you have to do a few steps to kind of like re clean so kind of like what the clean stop does with geometry this is like refreshing or redoing your um your vdbs so the other the other option that we can do is maybe we just want to scatter them first and then convert them to a vdb um, that might be a little bit better of a, of a workflow or of an approach. Yeah, doubling the res quadruples the data. It might even be um, it might even be like a higher exponent or, or relationship than that, like a power three. Uh, yeah, eight times. Um, so with images and two-dimensional data, doubling the resolution quadruples the data or quadruples the render time or all of those operations, but with voxels, it uh, it <laughs> is like the eight times scale or whatever. Because um, yeah, because if you middle mouse, you see it's like three numbers. So it's you're doing like three instead of this times this and doubling one of these numbers, getting uh, overall like quadruple. So you just have another uh, dimension in there. Um, there's also the volume stamp node. So I don't know if this this one works with VDBs, but we can give it a quick test. So this works basically like the, it looks like it doesn't work. This works basically like the copy sop. We got some gifters. What's going on? Brando, thank you very much. Um, so that maybe this need to convert to a fog volume. Um, I was, th I think that this, maybe I just need to activate the, the grid. Um, this might be, I might be going off on too much of a tangent. So I'm just going to pull out of this. <laughs> Some of this stuff you can't do in, in VEX that easily. The VEX, I don't know, but sometimes you, you enjoy the challenge and you just want every, you want to do everything in VEX. Um, so I'm going to activate this region. So it's basically like saying VEX is the only, the only know the drink. <laughs> What's the drink? This VEX. I want I want to try it. Um, so this is basically like turning on or saying, allow me to draw or put things in this area. Um, and then when I'm activating things, I, I don't want to actually assign a value yet. It looks like it's still not working. Um, this is kind of, I might just have to do it. So if you have a volume, um, Basically, this will do what a copy stop does, but it will operate with volumes. So if I just convert this to a Houdini fog based volume. Still doesn't seem to uh, to work that well. I, I might be missing something. Um, maybe I need to, to set up like the attribute stamping or it might need to be named density. Um, I'm, I'm just going to give up on that one for now. So I think the best, I don't know, this is more, I don't want to get too in the weeds with technical stuff. So what we can do is just copy all of our spheres or our, our shape or whatever onto the, um, the donut, onto the torus, and then convert everything to a VDB. So this, there's a few steps. Sometimes I do things differently. So 
So this is a bit too many points that we have here, like 22 million. Um, so we want to just optimize our, our scroll down a little bit. Um, you either sometimes remesh or, um, or poly reduce are good ones to use. But basically, the idea here is that we're going to just spend a lot of time, maybe a couple of seconds, generating like a more more optimized one, and then that reduction in points. Like if we cut cut that in half or around half, we'll we'll have a lot of savings overall. So we go from 50 million points, or I think we we're at 20 million, uh, down to 2 million. And then um, this VDB from polygons uh, is just a lot quicker. We could even get away with a, a higher resolution now. So I might want. Maybe there's like too many of them right now. Um, let's try half as many. Let's try 125. Maybe something like that is a little bit more interesting. I might do a jitter uh, before. You have to be careful with this because it can blast away your normals. Like it's trying to compute new normals on the points, which don't have polygons, so it can't calculate normals, and then it just gives up and, and sets them to uh, like the default. Um, and then I actually I think I want these guys like pointing along the surface of the uh, the shape, so that they're all looking outwards, um, so that this feature is just more more recognizable. Um, like some of these, it just looks like spheres that you can't really tell what uh, what shapes are in here. So I think if I have all of my little demon skull heads um, looking outwards, it's going to be a more interesting result. So we can do that by basically using information from the source geometry. Um, so you just use this polyframe node. This one's very useful. They've even added new uh, new modes like this attribute gradient and Mickey T or Mick T. Uh, this stuff is pretty fancy. It could be fun to use. Uh, but basically we, we just, we could either use the normal um, or the tangent. I think with just the normal, all of these vectors are, are pointing outwards. We should be pretty good with that. Um, and then this, instead of I'm going to go back to one, just like a unit scale. And instead of making a normal, um, I'm going to make, I'm going to have this make an up vector. So control middle mouse. And then if I click on this, then you can see we, we now have two vectors. So using these, you can specify more of like a, an orientation and a rotation. So they'll be look, constrained to look in a certain direction, but then rotated or spun around that uh, axis. If you want, um, Houdini has a specific documentation page that's just about copying instancing attributes. And you can see specifically there how these uh, get stacked up. And then uh, Henry or Toadstorm, he has a really good like in-depth guide about copy and instancing. Uh, the copy stuff is part of this. And he, I think he goes into um, a super, it's like a master class on copy and instancing pretty much. So there's some VEX codes in there. Uh, this is the kind of spinning that I'm talking about. He's, he's doing something else with matrices, but basically you have a normal or up that's constraining it along an axis. And then you can use the other vectors to to rotate uh, like that, essentially. So let's see if that's doing what I think it's doing. Sometimes these uh, get messed up. 
Um, and I will just do a swap like this. So I'll just, um, I'm not using substance too much. I was trying to use it a little bit um, before. Jack, how's it going? Good to see you again. Um, so Substance Painter, I was trying to use it a little bit, but it was just a little bit, um, their licensing model, I wasn't using it too much. So I ended my subscription for a little bit. And I think when like Adobe bought them, I got a little bit uh, <laughs> upset with, with uh, I, I don't know, I'm not a big Adobe Creative Cloud subscription person. Uh, so I'm just going to make sure I'm doing pretty good powering through a, a Friday. Um, sometimes I do this file node, this guy, you can see like the default axes made a screenshot of this, which the Kim Davidson emote, <laughs> hopefully he doesn't get mad at me. <laughs> so, um, I just want to make sure he's looking down the Z axis. So the, the Z axis is what internally gets used in the copy node for the up vector and stuff like that. Um, so I'm just going to, I think I had it right the first time before swapping it. We can see that they're all um, looking along the surface normal. <laughs> yeah, that's from when he was getting the, the Oscar, the, uh, the, the like scientific award or whatever. Um, so we have, we have these things now, it's pretty nice. If you just wanna see this up vector, you can get different rotations. You kind of see what I'm talking about here, like um, how they're constrained to be looking in a certain direction, but we're just spinning them around that vector, which is pretty cool. Um, so I might I'm gonna try to get them uh, trying to think what I want to do here. So maybe something, something like that is, is pretty cool. I want it to be like in an interesting territory where you look at it for the first time and you can't uh, necessarily, it kind of looks like either a noise but then you start to make out some faces and you start to, to realize what's going on. It's kind of like if you look at clouds, you start to see shapes and stuff like that in them. Um, but I might even do, like a, a double scatter. So sometimes like using a noise, you have more than one octave or making fractals and stuff like that. Um, you have more than one, uh, I'm just gonna turn off that visualization, more than one layer of detail or, or level of detail. So I'm gonna do like a broader um, scatter that's going to be bigger so if I look at these P scales, we have nice broad, big circles. Um, this is gonna be a base shape so that my end result isn't as uh, recognizable as like a, a donut or whatever. Um, so I'm just gonna make a, a quick thing right here. We'll go back to points and you can reuse this copy sap. Um, and then I just want it, I think there's like a little bit of a difference between uh, my P scale and like the, this thing isn't a proper unit. Uh, like if this was actually the size of properly one or maybe 1.5, then it would be the same size as those discs that I'm visualizing things as. Um, 
We might want to get rid of this neck a little bit more too, just so it's not as, as sharp. So I'll just do that right now. Just do another clip. Maybe it makes the most sense to do that um, right before we fill fill the hole, so I don't have to fill the the hole a second time. I'm just going to grab the the first clip. It was lined up a little bit better than before. This should be better, I think. So now we got rid of some of that uh, blockiness or whatever. Um, maybe with these ones, I don't want to do the random up vector. You can also use some of these extra things as up vectors. We should make a click and drag tool for the clip node. That's it. it's just uh, the UI for it isn't maybe isn't the best. <laughs> so the some of these old like transform gizmos, I think they just need to update the the UI for them or something like that. It'd be the best I think would be like in the viewport if you did a you could just draw a line like and it would transform that into like a object space or something. You could just slice. It's like Fruit Ninja or something. Um, so I'm, I'm going to clean this stuff up for a second. And with this, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, the camera projection I think would be really cool. They need to, some of, some of the, uh, <laughs> the Fruit Ninja, some of the viewport tools they've been updating and they're like super useful now, but I think they haven't finished all of them or something. So we have different different options to when we're generating this up vector. Um, just turn my, my visualization on again. So these ones, because you have this set to um, two edges, that's why they get crisscrossed like that sometimes. Um, And sometimes there's still like some seams and things like that that I'm I'm thinking about what the best way is to fix those. But this might be, I think this is good enough for right now. So I'm just trying to get a, a, a different distribution instead of completely random. So something with like some order or uh, repetition or, or something like that. Let me try, let me try something here. So sometimes, um, sometimes what I do is I'll just manually go in and you can do not a deformation wrangle, uh, just the attribute wrangle. Um, so if I do a cross product, Sometimes you can get a better, more control over that, that other vector. <laughs> Finally get into some vex. So you do cross of n, um, and then the other uh, vector, concrete pillar with blood dripping down. 
the inevitable death of Manta? You mean Mantra? Or Manta is a different god? I feel like the death of, of Mantra will hopefully be coming soon. <laughs> They're already trying to start with uh, yeah, Mantra. <laughs> with uh, Karma, they're trying to to uh, phase it out. But I, I wish they would just have GPU. Um, so this usually will give it like a custom direction uh, and then it will, uh, you're basically saying like spin everything just by 90 degrees based on this other axis. It's like a kind of like a transform node or something like that. Yeah, Karma, uh, I don't know if it's, um, it's not far enough along yet, I think, to use, to rely on post-production, or I mean, just like production. So if I normalize these vectors, sometimes they aren't always like a unit or whatever coming out. Um, it's one thing I can do. I might, I'm just gonna try doing different axes. You can see we're just spinning everything basically. Octane, Redshift has the, the sale. They're doing like 30% off or something. I can't, it wouldn't let me do it because I already had bought it before. So one thing you can see right here is I think, just gonna make more points. Um, maybe I need less. So I think we're good. I was just worried that these were like flipping around when it goes uh, on the other side of the uh, the origin for, from uh, positive to negative. Um, so I was just doing that in up uh, in uh, normal to visualize it. So now we have them more like aligned or, or flowing with the shape or whatever. You bought it a week ago, Alex. <laughs> too bad. You might be able to email them and get like a. Uh, See if they still honor the discount or something like that. RIP your wallet. But um, it's a good investment regardless of even at the default rate or whatever. It's still pretty cheap compared to a lot of other renderers. Um, sometimes, whoops. <laughs> They should, I think you can email them about like a student discount or educational discount. Um, sometimes what I try is doing like another cross product. So basically doing a double cross product. So you take the first one and then you just rotate it 90 degrees again, uh, but using itself as the input. You can see now I'm getting like kind of these guys there it is. It's kind of what I was trying to do. So they're all rolling or, or rotating along the edge of that, uh, the torus. Maybe they're busy with the, uh, the sale or something like that. Um, I don't know. I, I haven't, I've only posted on their forums and they've, they've seemed to get back to me pretty quickly with like technical support issues and stuff like that. All right, so let's try maybe a little bit bigger. Um, I'm also just gonna do, this is just another kind of lazy way to do things, but um, using this facet, uh, it's a quick way if you just do reverse normals, you can flip stuff around. So if I wanted to with Vex, I could also multiply the normal by negative one down here um, it just depends if you want to type more codes or just use the tab menu more. Rohan showed some good stuff with Octane. Yeah, he was testing all three of them a while back, uh, and his results seemed pretty good. I'm interested with, um, Octane, they have other, like, features or plugins, or I'm not exactly sure how they're organized, but, um, they have, like, the thing that's called Vectron or whatever, um, it's like special specialty for fractals. But I don't know if it's, you need to be using Cinema 4D and Octane at the same time. 
Um, but if you did it with, if you could do this with um, inside of Houdini, it'd be pretty cool to, to play around with. So the issue with like fractals is trying to make the, the geometry and then render it is you always run into a problem like running out of memory or disk space or whatever. But uh, if you can generate the, the fractals at render time <clears throat> using the GPU, you can get, you can start to get like infinite detail and zoom around and animate the camera and stuff and get like super cool results. So what I was doing here with flipping these guys around, um, what I want to do is use them to subtract from the torus. So I flip them around because I want to leave like an imprint of their, their heads or eyes or whatever. So you could do, you can either do a Boolean. I think the Boolean might struggle with like this many, um, this many polygons or, or faces or whatever. So I'm just going to do VDB from polygons. Um, and then I'll do another VDB for my torus. Is there any engine in Houdini that supports volumetric procedurals during render time except Mantra? I don't think so. I mean, you can, you can do render time procedurals with all the other render engines, but you need to get their developer kit and like, write C++ and compile stuff yourself and everything like that. Um, yeah, the, yeah, Vectron, Vectron is what I'm interested in. It's, I think it's, uh, it's kind of like their render time procedural that's actually like you can make, it's like with a user interface and stuff, but um, I haven't tried it personally, just because I haven't taken the time to set up Octane or anything like that yet. So with this VDB from the torus, with this other input, you can link it up so that resolution matches. Uh, it's a, sometimes a nice shortcut, or instead of doing like relative reference, uh, you can do it do it this way, and it's nice. Like instead of doing a relative reference of the voxel size in the parameter. These VDBs you can get carried away and get like really really wild with the. Uh, the, the lines, the, the inputs and stuff. Um, so we, we have some different things that we can do that this, this thing might be a cool one, like a, a mask or something like that. You're cutting away and you, you look inside and there's a bunch of uh, skulls. It's kind of like a window or something. Um, maybe we'll try difference. So I think this is the one that I was interested in where you're leaving like the imprint of them. It's like you're using them as a stamp that you're pushing into like Play-Doh or something like that. Um, it's like making a mold or something. So maybe with this jitter, this is gonna be a bit slow to, uh, just gonna work at a higher, uh, Voxel size until I have stuff dialed in a little bit more. Maybe two five. Sometimes it's hard to find a balance of like something you can tell what's going on and still runs quickly. The absence of something is always scarier. I think so. I think that uh, just compositionally too, it it's uh, it's underused. It's a it's a very successful way to. Uh, to make things interesting without like adding complexity or clutter or whatever. Um, so I, I maybe want these to be a little bit more evenly distributed. If you crank up the relax iterations, it will try to spend more time to like space them out evenly. Maybe I don't want them as big. And then this way, the absence of my knowledge of Houdini <laughs> That's something where less isn't more in that circumstance. Um, so I don't know what's going on here, but uh, somehow these things aren't being as, as evenly spaced as I want them to. Um, see what happens. Maybe we don't scatter and uh, Let's just make a P scale. 
Whoops. So what I'm trying to do here is just use the repetitiveness of the torus or whatever instead of the scatter. So this will this will be more of like a fractal um, pattern or something like that. Just have to make sure I spell things properly today. So you kind of see what I mean here with this being like a fractal. It's just like a repetitive uh, sculpting tool or, or shaping tool or whatever. It's kind of like they have this thing for, for might have been a soft, soft image tool or something. Um, it might be maybe for, for Blender they ported it over. Uh, but this is really a really cool tool where you can basically use topology as like a copy copy to points thing or something like that. Some people have replicated like parts of it inside of Houdini. Um, but to, to actually get like lines connecting and topology uh, like stitching together, I haven't seen anyone do that with completely inside of Houdini yet. This is kind of like a quick hack of, of doing that kind of tool though. So maybe I'm just going to do a reference copy for this torus um, so that I can, I'll just retain if I change the size or shape of it, but uh, now I can manually change my um, divisions. So maybe we want more than more than eight. So we have more of them around the perimeter. That might have been the wrong one. Let me see. So, okay. So this one we need more. All right, let's just see what what happens. I don't know if I'm going to keep this. I might go back to the the random um, distribution. For right now, I'm just going to go to polygons um, so that I can feed in these other operations. So we're, we're now using this as our starter shape. Um, and then we'll be doing a second layer or a second like iteration of scattering and, and copying at a smaller scale. So if we merge these two together, we have a combination of something with normals and something without normals. So we just need to add them to this input. Something is something's still wrong. These guys here might have too many attributes. P, e, name, n. P e and n should work. Might have just been like the viewport, not uh, refreshing or something like that. I don't know how, I think this, what, yeah, this is where we were at. Um, I just need less, less of these extra ones. Maybe we just make them smaller. Maybe my jitter amount is like a little bit too high. This kind of stuff is 
I think a little bit better. Um, so I think going back here, get, doing this random uh, or the, the repetitive pattern might have been a bad idea for this circumstance at least. Um, make them bigger, even big. Oh, so I'm setting the P scale down here, which is uh, ignoring, ignoring my uh, scale radii. So this is probably better, I don't know, just a more organic uh, shape. So now I think it's a little bit more interesting. Something I might do um, with these normals right here, I might do a peak instead of like the jitter. Um, so this move moves things along the normals or um, it's kind of like infl inflation or deflation. Uh, my normals they're all going the same way <laughs> something is uh, amiss they should be doing something like this I think I've done it I thought I did it before with geometry but um, I guess it doesn't like oh. Somehow, might not like that it's a polygon soup. I think that's the case. Yeah, so sometimes you have to be careful converting this to a polygon soup, and it won't um, support as many attributes or. Uh, like you can't edit it, you can't delete paces and do certain things like that. So you, sometimes you have to be a bit careful. I, I have the habit of setting it to polygon soup. It's like a more efficient um, primitive type for rendering like super dense, super high resolution VDBs, but from sometimes all the modeling operations and stuff don't work on it. So I should be good now with this thing working the way that, that I want it to. So with this, I can just move move things inwards a little bit. Now we have these guys are like sitting inside instead of uh, poking out the other way. So instead of being as blobby or bumpy of a shape or whatever, um, they're just more like combined with the uh, the donut or the 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 shape. So I might just throw this VDB from polygons at the end and just go back to uh, just keep going back and forth between <laughs> volumes and uh, and voxel or voxels and polygons. You, it can be a bit lazy if you're doing like serious modeling, but for for generating like abstract shapes and kind of procedural modeling techniques, this going between volumes and uh, polygons is a pretty pretty like useful or nice way to work. So I think, let's see how much detail and stuff we can get out of it. So it's taking like 10 seconds now to go, uh, might be a bit slow. And I'm also just gonna try more, I think we need more uh, and smaller of the little skulls. So let's do 
755. More. More is always better. Yeah, I don't know. I'm trying to do like an, I don't know, it's like a subtraction at the start and then in addition at the, instead of just purely, like if I was doing everything additively, like we would always be expanding. Um, so hopefully this will be interesting. I don't know. It's like chiseling out the broad features and then just adding some subtle uh, things. I, I, I find generally like the larger disparity you have between differences in scale is better. Like if you have something super big and then stuff that's super small, it makes it more interesting than having like something that's just slightly smaller than, than the big thing, if that makes sense. We might, that VDB from uh, polygons, we might want to make that a higher resolution or, or do something here to get these things working a little bit better. Um, if we, if we also wanted to frame in closer, we might want to like crop out or chop away some of the other surfaces just to optimize things. I'm going to go back up a little larger and even more of them. See how much breaking of stuff we can do. Your Instagram post of pills coming from the shape of the face, 20 seconds, and how you did that would be cool or for another lesson. Yeah, I could go over that sometime. Um, so I think like basically, um, trying to think of the best way to, to do, to explain it. Um, it's all based off of, of curves essentially. Like if you've seen everyone on, on Instagram doing those like flow lines around the shape, um, I'm just moving those pills along curves. Uh, I think there's like mops tools and stuff for it, but um, usually like if, if you have a circle um, polygon, we might even be able to, to add that in to this thing a little bit, but um, so you, you have any line shape or anything like that in Houdini, um, then you have a sphere like any, you can kind of apply any source to target. Um, this might be better with the path, the form stuff that they added in the Houdini 18.0.499. But um, basically, if you just set the P, you can find a position on that curve um, and do that based off of the uh, prim UV or prim. So this will find a like parametric position. Parametric just means it always exists, like it's intrinsic or it's uh, it's it's part of the actual geometry. Like I'm not reading a specific attribute that's the UV. This is like the actual UV that's just a length between zero and one. So if I do zero point five, that should be halfway around the circle. And um, if you add to it, if you just add time, then you can see it's starting to rotate. Then it reaches one eventually. Um, so you can do modulus one that will give you just the remainder, like it's doing a division, but instead of giving you the cumulative result, uh, this is giving you the remainder. Then just with order of operations, uh, I need to do the addition before that division and it's going wee 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 <laughs> so you could get pretty quickly into those places so you just do like scatter um, relax to get stuff like along the edges again do um, radius 
and copy to points. Maybe the other shift R, just reverse the these inputs. Um, right now I'm setting them all to 0 0.5, but I could do a random number based off of the point num um, so that they're all it might they might just be a bit too fast now. So that you could very quickly get scatter things on splines and then have them ride around the spline. Uh, you really like go to town with this vex stuff and do more randoms. So like the time distance is different. Um, you can also inherit these parametric or like prim UV values. So instead of uh, assigning a random one, um, you can start you can basically acquire that coordinate or that position um, when things are are scattered. So now it's using its actual p real position or starting point position. Um, so there's a bunch of different stuff or whatever, but this was the, the basic idea behind that stuff. I think that there was other, um, there was a bunch of other little hacks and stuff like that to get things like evenly distributed and, and padded and stuff properly. Um, I think at the end I was even doing like an RBD simulation to get to fix like little penetrations and things, but this is this is this kind of fundamentals or starting point or whatever for that idea. Yeah, the uh, prim UV stuff is super cool. You can even move stuff along surfaces. Like if you have NURBS, um, you, you can, uh, I think Cinema 4D kind of works a little bit like that way with their effectors and stuff where you can uh, fields like you can use a torus effector maybe and then have stuff like use that to uh, to add motion or whatever to your shapes, if that makes sense. So I think we're, I don't know, it's somewhat interesting. Um, yeah, the prim UV stuff is cool. And then that's another thing with the docs. Um, that's an area that they've documented really well recently. So I think with Houdini 18 um, or maybe 17.5, they added this special um, page. We'll just put a link in the chat. Um, but they talk about kind of how this is derived. So with triangles or quads, you have um, zero and one uh, for the, the two different corners. And then this corner is zero, zero, zero. Um, they talk about with other shapes, the tetrahedras have them, um, curves have them. So that's basically what I was doing here with, with things that are zero to one. Um, Things like this font that's an n-gon, like you run into problems because it doesn't necessarily have, uh, it can't calculate it if it's just a single face, essentially. Hopefully that's helpful. I don't know. I think it's anything that they've added pictures to in the docs, I'm immediately just like, this is amazing. This is gold. So this, it might be cool. Let's, um, Let's see what we can do with it. So this guy's already taking 23 seconds. Um, we might be able to make this into a soup to, to speed it up. Golden sauce. <laughs> it's hard to find the, those pages. Sometimes I see other people pointing them out and then I'll bookmark them or something. They, they don't always do a good job of telling people when they add that kind of stuff to it, but it's, uh, it's always nice. So I'm trying to basically make my skull into a um, polygon soup primitive before I copy it. I'm just trying to see if that will speed up the um, VDB conversion, but it looks like it's not helping out that much. Might even be slower. 
So before I was at like 23 seconds and now I'm at 33. But poly soups, you see it's, I'm cutting down a little bit of, of uh, information there. Let's just take a look at this. Maybe I want to just work with a poly reduce. So this iteration, we're sprinkling smaller shapes onto it. So we might be able to get away with less um, polygons or less details. So this guy before is doing 23 seconds. Let's just take a, another benchmark. Got it down to five seconds. What do we do with that extra time? <laughs> More detail. So that's the, the classic visual effects artist uh, blunder or <laughs> trap. You, a render takes one hour, so you, you just make the, the settings even better so that it takes longer. Um, this is, I don't know, it's pretty interesting. It's uh, start to think about maybe like lighting and rendering and things like that. So interesting, I don't know, like combination of, you can tell that there's a main circular shape or form uh, and then there's things sticking out in interesting ways. And sometimes you can kind of, your eye catches like a little face. So I think it's gonna be nice to work with this VDB analysis. Um, maybe use the curvature. And the visualization of this is always a bit of a mess. Dark souls. <laughs> It's, a, it's kind of like that, or even some of, sometimes it looks like the, um, like H.R. Geiger, or like that kind of art style from, from Aliens and stuff. Like he always, it's kind of, I don't know if this is TOS. He, he, sometimes he has some, uh, some <laughs> weird paintings, but basically like very repetitive, um, somewhat organic or, or skull based shapes or stuff like that. So the, what, at the start, that's kind of what I was thinking about a little bit with the uh, skulls that were like copy stamped along the geometry without the scatter node or whatever. Um, so I'm just gonna convert to polygons here. And uh, then you can do attribute from volume. to fetch or like sample that curvature attribute. So now maybe it's a little bit more interesting or easy to, to decipher some of those like facial features. Um, with Redshift, uh, I think with Octane as well, like all the, most of the renders in Houdini, I think even Arnold, you can uh, read attributes. So I could do different shaders and stuff like that with this value, it's super useful. Um, Sometimes you want to do some smoothing or, or stuff like that. You want to bring back the skulls. It's it like Grateful Dead. They were big, big into the skull culture. Um, so you, you could do a smooth to blur the curvature value. Um, sometimes you get better or more interesting results if you do smooth SDF like before um before you calculate the curvature so you basically we're doing blurs but whether we do the blur before um we calculate the curvature or a blur based off of the results of the curvature operation you get like different um different outputs or whatever so this is a little bit more interesting it's like a little bit more stylized or whatever Could be pretty cool. You even do these as um, the redshift curvature node. Yeah, so that's that's another one that's um, nice. You're talking about this one, Alex. Um, 
so this one's pretty cool, but just with this radius, it kind of acts as like a, a blur. We might use it as well, um, but it's a little bit less controllable and it can get a little expensive um, with with rendering and stuff, but definitely for like adding little cracks and uh, and stuff like that, it's, it's nice. Um, I also like this because I could even use this attribute now for, for more sculpting and stuff. Um, so if I wanted to add like detail or noise but just in these crevices, uh, you could do that if you wanted to. Um, I might do just re kind of remap this value a little bit. Um, so I think I can just do ramp from attribute from color. Um, and now I just have, it's kind of like a fit range, uh, function, I believe. So you can see I'm like, cause this curvature, if you do a slice, you can really inspect, um, the values that this curvature is giving me. Um, so if I, it looks like it's stopping at zero maybe. So with this infrared, you can always tell if something is one, like if it's reaching this limit of 25, uh, then it will clip out to red and uh, anything that's zero will be uh, this blue, mid purple color or whatever. <laughs> Love the slice. So that's a useful way of just like inspecting ranges or, or finding that stuff. Get more psychedelic skull. This is really into Grateful Dead territory now. Um, but yeah, this is maybe a little bit better. Um, you can do like kind of a gamma correction or whatever with this these curves. So let's see if we can get some more uh, some more detail. I'm gonna let this cook. See how long it takes. Let me get some water, and uh, I'll be right back. So it's just 16 seconds. It's not too bad. Um, it looks like my curvature range shifted a little bit. Might This might be a better result or we could try to get back closer to where we were. Um, it's actually a pretty cool expression we got with those guys. So maybe I'm, I'm just going to increase this poly reduce. So we should have some more detail. Um, some more definition or whatever in some of these features. I'm, I'm getting ready to move into shading and, and rendering and stuff like that. I just want to make sure we're, we're working with something good instead of starting with something that's already like shitty. So you could imagine, uh, who was it? Brando? Yeah, so with that um, pills workflow and everything, like you can do a similar idea with these skulls. You could have them like rotating around the edges or whatever of this thing, like a this could even be like an atomic bomb, like a mushroom cloud or something like that. If you had them all like rotating and rolling around the edges of this uh, torus, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, Tauruses and that primitive UV stuff or whatever is always nice because you have like um, it's kind of just like a vort vortice or whatever 
um, just with fluid simulations and stuff, it's like this is a, essentially a torus, like cross section or, or shape or whatever. Um, but with anytime you see a vortex, like this, this could be the cross section of a, of a torus, or you could do a similar thing with a sphere. Um, these could be toruses that are like injecting tangential forces along the, the surface normals. So just using those simple primitives, you, you can like recreate motions of, of fluid simulations and stuff and get cool, cool results. Um, yeah, so we got a little bit more detail just because I, I increased the poly reduce or whatever. Um, we might get like 3 million points. I don't know how much more we want to push things just because it's like a lot of geometry for redshift to, uh, to chew on. Even going inside things, maybe turn off this, the back faces. Turn off this grids and stuff. So even going inside of here, it's like some you're lost in the uh, the dark the dark place, stuck in a cave or something like that. So this is like the uh, Baron Baron Semdi or Semedi. Like he had that uh, makeup or like the the same outlines of the face or whatever were kind of highlighted. We've got a, a bunch of little barren semites over here. <laughs> so this is, uh, I think we're at a good starting point for our render. So I'm just trying to think about how we might want to frame this up compositionally. This, this area right here is like a pretty nice feature to make a camera. Once you have a camera, you can start actually like changing the lens and stuff. So usually I just start with 36 as my sensor size or aperture is like the same as a SLR, or like a full frame camera. Um, and then I just, I don't know, I'm, I go between phases. Right now I'm a fan, more of a fan of longer lenses. And then just lock the the uh, camera or tie it to the viewport. So maybe something like this could be nice if we just do like a uh, corner or quadrant or whatever. Um, let's do the redshift light. And uh, usually, I, I don't know why, but I'm in the habit of doing materials in the same fashion or whatever. Um, I don't know, just so like if I'm moving scene to scene, I can grab all this stuff and copy and paste it instead of working out of uh, going into these different contexts. Then if you reuse stuff, it just is like harder to, to find. Uh, so we'll put this shader on our geometry. Um, I think we're ready to go. Let's get this. Get this thing spinning. So I might, what is this? It's already pretty cool, the rim, rim light. Someone was uh, drag and drop the RS mat. Yeah, you can drag and drop it into the viewport, but I don't know if this, their render view supports it. <laughs> 
I, just with the default light, it's looking good. Uh, someone was saying that CG artists use the the rim light way too much, or they they rely on it. But it's um, I don't know. I think it's a really good way to like imply more detail than you have there. Like if this is fully lit, it's finished. We might, we might want to save it just to to capture our progress or whatever. Um, I'm I'm gonna try moving the light around and see what happens. But uh, we'll just keep our progress here. So this is uh, is this still this June nineteenth uh, scenes. Skull. Uh, I don't know. This is it was a donut. Now it's a uh, tire. I don't know. Skull. Taurus version one. Done. <laughs> Send it to the client. Um, so one thing I can do here, like I was talking about with the soups, polygon soups, skull nut. <laughs> um, if you do this at the very end, this is a good uh, place to, to use this node. Like basically it reduces the file size. So it's transferring stuff to and from Redshift, or if I'm saving this out as a BG, it will make that size smaller. So I middle mouse up here, and you can see it's using 608 megabytes of memory. But after I do the polygon soup, it's down to like 271 uh, megabytes of memory. So it's a more efficient way because it's getting, it's basically saying, forget about all these primitives. They, they don't have any variation in attributes. There's no sense in storing, keeping track of a bunch of extra data, essentially. Uh, it took me a long time to really know what was going on. Uh, you can do a pack, but because I'm not really instancing or like the same stuff would have to happen, it would still have to transfer, copy the geometry to the GPU. Um, so I don't think one, one pack would help that much. If I was like turning these into a bunch of packed copies or whatever, then it would help. So with Redshift, it's nice. It has the um, uh, instance SOP level packed primitives. So when you do have a lot of packed geometry, you can uh, do that really nice. The, the only way that a pack would actually help, I think, is if I did save this out to disk and then using file um, load packed disk. So packed disk primitive is basically not even loading <clears throat> the geometry into Houdini. Like it would be passing it directly to Redshift. And uh, that, that would be a faster way instead of like caching, putting the geometry into Houdini's RAM or memory and then transferring that to the GPU memory. I don't know, that's a pretty, that's a much more advanced workflow or whatever, but it's more like the delayed load rendering stuff that Houdini used to have. They still use it, but people stop, they still have it, but people stop using it just because like pack disk primitive is kind of a replacement of that workflow. So I think now that it's packed geometry, it might take a little bit. We'll see, but it seemed like the first time I rendered it, it took like a minute. This might be a little bit quicker. I don't know. Um, let's get our light. My drag and drop has been like a bit messy recently. Just like finding out where I'm at here in my, my light. Sometimes I, I don't know, right now I'll keep it on to, to keep track of stuff. Um, maybe this Maybe we just want to go a little bit smaller with it. Let's try a little bit longer of a lens. That lens doesn't uh, always update right away with the camera. For whatever reason, exchange computer. I don't know, it works fine, but it's just when I'm using uh, OBS and, and streaming it, it uh, is like less, 
less uh, functional or just a, there's like a probability that it seems to 10% of the time it will work properly. Um, and other other times or other days it just glitches out. But like when I'm, it's, it throws me off because when I'm working without streaming, it, everything works fine. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to crop in, frame that up a little bit differently. Let's get back to the light. This kind of stuff just depends how much uh, contrast or, or rim kind of lighting we want. Um, usually I'll start to work with this bounce lighting on. Uh, just so I'm not like getting thrown off by that later. Maybe just increase this kind of like a higher exposure. No, I still haven't used, I still haven't set up the ASUS workflow yet. Um, I've, I read much more about it yesterday uh, from Henry's website, but um, just having to convert all the textures, I need to do that step now. Do you have a workflow for storing different camera positions you like rather than making 20 different cameras? Usually I make 20 different cameras. Um, yeah, I don't know. And then usually those cameras turn into different scenes and stuff eventually. You, you could like use these different takes if you wanted to. Um, I'm not a big fan of using these takes. It's kind of like the, the, if you use Maya or stuff before, it's like the idea of render layers essentially. Um, but I, I don't know. I don't have a problem. Yeah. Takes are a bit messy and I prefer to, to just have all the cameras in the, uh, in the same object level or whatever. Um, I heard you can't actually see accurate ACES output in the RS render view. That's possible. I, I remember in Henry's article, he had mentioned um, some caveats with with the other renders and stuff. Um, you have to set environment variables and things. I don't know if like here, I think if I did OCIO and I had the ASUS uh, config, then I could <laughs> then I could have it being displayed that would that's my thinking. I don't know if I'm 100% right, though. We've got a <laughs> these souls are trapped in in a uh, in a merry ground. They're trying to <laughs> escape. Uh, Henry is the guy Toadstorm. Um, so he he wrote the guide to it. He's also the developer um, with Mops with the motion operators inside of Houdini. Um, I think he, I'm not doxing him here. Like he's, he's gone on the side effects streams and talked about his name and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I think he was talking about using this with, he was saying like Redshift doesn't pick up the co color management area of Maya, but I don't know if. Then he was talking about something else. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not going to get too lost with that stuff yet. I'm not even using colors, so it doesn't. This ASUS, I don't know if it would be too helpful right now. Um, so we have our color attribute. We could use that with this point. Uh, get the attribute from our geometry. Um, if we want to double check. This might be like re, uh, might need to re, re render, refresh my render view to get the geometry to load again. So usually I'll do that just to verify that um, it's getting the information. And Maybe I don't want to use that as like diffuse color. Um, 
it gets a little bit boring if you're just always like driving the surface color with the, the attribute. Um, I'm going to try doing two different materials and blending them based off of uh, maybe even like specular roughness or something could be. See what happens with that. So we have reflection roughness. Um, so this is going to make it like more sharp reflections in the uh, black areas and white is uh, blurry. You might want to do the change, change range. So you could flip it around if you wanted to like, like that. Now this is a little bit more, more interesting, I think with uh, stuff being silhouetted it's kind of like a bone a bone material or something and then a uh, polished metal so that might be interesting um i think i'm going to try to just do this with two different completely different materials instead of overwriting like parameters on one material. Uh, that's sometimes an easier way to control things instead of like remapping a bunch of ranges and stuff. Uh, so you just do another RS material. Um, I'm going to start with subsurface for this one. So I don't know if they have a good, they don't, their skin shader is separate, so it's not necessarily the best starting point. Um, I think maybe the jade is a somewhat reasonable starting point. I think I need to, should have just set this to defaults. Um, I think on my redshift wrap, if I do like SOP update changes, um, did they change the name of this parameter? There's something that's like live update. Is it in the IPR? Oh, thank you. Yes. So I think with that one, it's a, it's a little bit confusing, but I think that way, like in the future, when I start to, if you switch out shaders and materials, it's, it reads those uh, changes uh, more more quickly. Even though those aren't SOP based changes, it should. Um, I think it's basically just referring to like the your entire scene graph as as SOPs. So I could switch between these without like re recaching my uh, render view. Um, so I'm just going to use this jade to kind of try to make more of like a bone uh, or organic type of material. So just do, you know, there's like too much green in this thing right now. I think some of the green is over here from the defeatus. So this, this might be somewhat close to a, a bone, bone based material. Maybe we want our reflections. Where is this? This is, this is going to be too weird to use the, I'm just going to go to the IOR for now. Spooky. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this, I don't know, it's starting to get there. Just need some rougher 
reflections maybe. Um, I might just, I think everything's too bright, but I don't want to mess around with this overall. I want to keep stuff like in the same kind of range for exposures and stuff. Um, I, and then just work with my light or with this uh, exposure at the end. Uh, so now with this one, instead of driving just the specular roughness, what I can do is material blender with redshift. Um, get that in there. Uh, maybe the base material is our bone. And then layer one will be um, the metal. And then this blend color is basically the blend amount, like the bias between those two. So if I go up to 0.8, then I'm doing like 80% metal, 20% bone. Um, but I can just use this uh, attribute to, to blend or change between them. Um, so I think we want to go zero, whoops, do one and zero. And then this source range, just play around with that to get different uh, like fitting. I don't know if this, maybe it wants it to be a um, vector. Sometimes this stuff with redshift gets weird casting between like floats and vectors. Um, they, they don't always have the best nodes for working too, too in depth with like SOP based, or like uh, VOP based stuff. Sometimes the, what was it? Color maker. Just flood, flood all the channels with that value. I don't know why it's not uh, not seeing all my results the way that I think I should be. Looks like my range. I'm just going to go back to uh, vector. It might be like my attributes didn't uh, didn't update properly. Let's just give it a another chance to think about everything. All right. So we're doing it properly. It looks good. Um, I think I just want to flip everything around. And then just play around with these. Uh, I don't know if this looks like it's working. So if I slam these values down like too close together, it's just too, a lot of contrast between the uh, materials. Um, and maybe I want this like a rougher metal. It's possible. I don't know if these. Um, Like if you do some negative numbers, then you get, uh, you should get some areas that still have like some metal in it, essentially. It's not the best way to, to work, but if you're just going quickly or whatever, sometimes you have to do it. 
this is basically like changing the the black point to like a gray value essentially let me uh maybe do the <clears throat> power so this is just like a gamma on the color, essentially. So this makes it super crisp. Uh, go down to something like 0.5. And then we'll get more of like a blurry kind of blend or something like that. So I think this higher value, like a crisp, it's just more of a graphic, more interesting of a of a look of a of a look. Like it's more like stylized painted uh bones or something like that. Um let's just move this light. I'm just going to go up and change my uh, intensity so we're not like overexposing as much. <clears throat> Did this thing stop, stop updating? <laughs> Crapped out on me. No worries, Alex. Thanks for coming by. Got some, a few gems, one or two gems. This this thing's actually kind of looking like a gem. It's like a min. Like sometimes you see, uh, if you look at rocks, you, like you'll see the gold veins or like stuff, uh, the metal inside of the the rocks or whatever. It's kind of like something like that here. Um, but I think this light is pretty nice. Let's uh, do the classic grid. This is the uh, pat patented bounce light technique. Creepy crystal. <laughs> you don't want to find it. You get cursed if you uh, if you take this crystal with you. So just turn off primary ray visible, um, and then you can use this like a bounce light, a bounce card, essentially. <clears throat> so the camera, I don't know why my camera is, uh, what the hell is going on? My camera's invisible. Um, oh, I don't know. So take this grid. I just want to try to get some kind of light kicking back. So I think it's working like kind of like a shadow right there. Now you were getting some just some extra subtle kind of uh, reflection. So this is that actual card reflecting in the um, in the image, if I shrink it down, we can kind of dial in the uh, the size of those reflections. Yeah, it's uh, like any. If you want to learn how to be good at lighting, you just need to actually look at like photograph uh, photographers or photograph books or stuff like that, and just steal their techniques. Seems like a lot of the older. Um, CG techniques for for rendering and stuff like that was relying on like faking things with with extra point lights in places and stuff. But now with renderers being like as as powerful as they are, where you can do uh, bounce lighting for free, kind of, um, it just makes more sense to work 
more like a photographer would. Uh, that way your like bounce light intensity will always look natural. Um, if you do it with like, I could put another area light here or something to fake it, but then I would always have to be adjusting like different values of different lights. And uh, it's not, it's not the best way to work. I'm just trying to get like a sliver of detail, like a hint. Um, so we still have sharp contrast or sharp line or something like that. Uh, I'm just gonna make a copy of this camera. And um, then I can take my, my first one, and just move it around, try some different. This is kind of cool <clears throat> how it's like creeping in like that. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> It's like the, uh, let me see if any of these, it's this one here. This one is, is doing a pretty nice one of like setting a uh, focal point, kind of like the first place your eye goes. Um, I'm gonna try moving the light around, but before I get too too adventurous, I'm just gonna save a new version. Uh, just like progress point, checkpoint. So I just want to try to get like more of a more of a, a, more shape, more of like a readable form or whatever. I don't know. I think it was better rimmed out. How? <laughs> Just focused directly, <laughs> directly on him. So I think something like this, 
I don't know, it might be cool to have something like <clears throat> foreground and then stuff further away in the background. Like two, two different layers. like a serious geological uh, expedition that we're in now. I feel like these redshift lights are super buggy in the uh, in the viewport. They don't do a good job of like representing what they actually uh, what they're actually doing. So I think my shaders might be a little bit of a mess. Um, might have done too too crispy of a uh, too harsh of a transition between the two two materials. It's nice to see like a little bit kind of poking through. You think just changing frames will, will make the IPR update a little bit better? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I, you know, like Arnold, like I think some renderers you can, it supports like working with the Houdini lights. Um, hopefully someday they'll, they'll support them. Like they should be interchangeable. Um, kind of like the camera is where you just add the extra properties to it. Um, maybe I'll just try just going to try some different presets for our metal blend material. Let's just see what happens. This, I feel like, would be the best situation for, for ASUS color transform. It's like this other stuff that gets clipped out, like super saturated like that. I think uh, ASUS would do a better job like preserving the highlights, essentially, or like not, not clipping out. You can do a little bit of kind of quick fixes using the <clears throat> tone mapping, um, this kind of stuff. But... Uh, I feel like it's better just to fix it with the ASUS. Um, I don't know about this plastic. I'm gonna try it. Maybe gold could be pretty cool. I feel like white, white, gold, and black is a pretty good color scheme. Whoa. Turn that off. Billy Ellis <laughs> tribute <laughs> or Billy. <laughs> Are you talking about uh, Billy's, the uh, the guy that makes the skulls? He's always adding the flowers and stuff like that that make it look pretty pretty nice, like roses, There's some red in there and, and things. Um, let me think. I think I'm gonna go back to a. Uh, it's a challenge to get interesting comps with one one ratios. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of the uh, the square, but we're all we're all stuck with it now. Um, I feel like working like more of a cinema scope or uh, like a I don't know what the um, wide aperture or whatever is uh, a lot more interesting doing. Like anamorphic, uh, that's that's the word I was looking for. Um, but yeah, Instagram 
has us all stuck in, in the square. I'm going to go back to, uh, yeah, I think the gold, like black, white, and gold is a good color combination. Um, let's just try some lights. I think this guy, this stuff like poking off is, is going to be better. So this is a little more readable. It's uh, maybe just like the closer you have the light then the more um, contrast, like highlight to dark you have. Uh, but if you move it away, everything kind of flattens out and maybe looks a little bit more realistic or whatever. Um, I think it's, it's this light is it's pretty nice. Maybe Get back in the camera, see what happens. I think what we had was working pretty well. All right, let's, uh, Just play around with this grid. Oh, thank you. I got carried away. Those were the, the redshift. Uh, I feel like the redshift should be able to do brute force caustics, but they don't let you, it's not supported or whatever. Um, but that would be the, the holy grail is doing like disper like proper spectral based dispersion with uh, path traced caustics or whatever. So I'm just trying to use this this bounce card to, uh, I don't know, get like a little bit more, more shape in there or something. Wave based iridescence. Yeah, if you could do the, the wavelength, uh, no more ramps, no more <laughs> rainbow ramps. I think this guy is like shadowing something happened here, but I don't know. It's a, maybe too much of it is like in the shadow there. So it's like kind of a, uh, Kind of a sweet spot, but it's like hitting too much, too much over there. Let's just get him right above everything. See what that does. Sometimes doing a um, scaling like one direction of these, you can really highlight or just add like lines, uh, like little, little glints that way.
So I think I'm getting this little, a little notch with it. Pretty good. Maybe try it going the other way. I think that looks maybe a little more natural. I don't know. I feel like I got uh, too too zoned in on a specific detail that that isn't working too well. This is just feeling more natural this way, or almost without it. Um, maybe do a little bit more intensity with the light um, just to get stuff looking a little bit brighter. Um, just play around with some of these post effects, the uh, instant glamour. I feel like you just have to be super, super subtle with uh, a lot of those. Boom. Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> so this goes from costing $1 to $5,000 just using that one uh, feature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm not a big, uh, I, I, it's a little cheesy I don't, as for this. I wanted a little bit more, um, I don't know. It makes it more of like a fantasy or uh, takes out the, the seriousness of it. Skull shine master series, <laughs> skull polisher. Let's just go. Whoop, let's go back into the camera. Um, I don't know. It's a little bit weird. That big swath of uh, darkness. You're a man of culture, Corin Yan. <laughs> this is a little bit better here, I think. It's like feels, I don't know, more, there's more of like dimensionality to it. The other one was feeling a little bit too, like two dimensional or too flat. I feel like that's a problem you run into when you're like rim lighting stuff too much is that it, it uh, loses its depth. Chromatic aberration. <laughs> you try to just use all of the, uh, the sliders. This is getting better. Just going up more over the top. Maybe a little too much. Let me see what's happening with this. Oof. <laughs> Maybe that's that's a little bit better. Having uh, I'm basically just adding kind of to the rim. I 
just to get rid of this this area here so it's not um, completely bl like blacked out or, or crushed. There's still some some subtle details. I think that uh, that helps a little bit. Let's play around with this exposure, the f stop. Um, Maybe this, I think my saturation is a little bit too, too cartoony. It's burning out a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know about this range. I'm gonna give it another, another play around. One of those skulls blinks. <laughs> you add the little eyeballs, the googly eyes or something into into all of them. Um, let's see what what happens with that radius, like this blurriness of the uh, subsurface. It's an interesting combination with something like super. Uh, cloudy or whatever, and then the gold is just super, like, punching out contrast. Maybe we want some more color attenuation. It's like absorption or something. It's a little bit more closer to, uh, to gold or something like that with it. All right, and um, of course, depth of field. Turn that on. <laughs> Why not? Um, then this click to focus is super, super nice. I don't think Redshift always had that. It's like a newer thing. Um, you should reduce this aspect at least it gets you closer to um like anamorphic bokeh or like a squeezed uh like when when stuff is out of focus it becomes uh squished that way kind of when you you reduce the aspect there's a bit a bit heavy handed. So something like that is is pretty cool. Maybe the gold, I don't know about it. Just feels like it's either too, too much specular roughness or, or uh, not enough. This one might be a little bit better. Uh, it's a dual monitor, but they are um, they are very wide. <laughs> it's like a bit uh, too too wide, perhaps. 
uh yeah it's like two, uh, they're i think they're like 34 inch or something like that so it's pretty big for for my uh my eyes to to look around at everything I, I was thinking about getting the um i think this is a little bit better with like keeping the the, the perimeter of that uh that shape um yeah it's a good neck exercise or I, I need to work out my posture more where it's like getting too uh chunked over um I might, I might try to adjust them as well but I, I, like the ultra wide the curve the curvature of them seemed a bit weird where it's like you have to um you have to be at the focal point of the parabola or whatever like to have the ideal experience i don't know i think this is pretty cool it's like um very luxurious you go between this could be like a pearl or a uh <laughs> you're just in a circle you buy four uh ultra wide curved monitors you're at the the control panel you're in the um the what is that what is the name of that thing the viable viable system model this this is like one of the best uh computer setups where is it this is um this is kind of like a so i think maybe they just called it cybersyn yeah so <laughs> you you're <laughs> you're in the panopticon of uh technology <laughs> <laughs> yeah so this um this was actually like the this was what was running chile's government for a little while uh, like i think that these were basically um a lot of it was fake like this was just a a, a slide like a designer would draw their ui because this was like the 70s or something like that um but yeah i i always want one of these like command centers the the dual screen, the four, uh, four dual screen monitors and everything. You get like the stock market going on, on one of them and everything. It's a nice, nice chair to, to listen to stuff in. But yeah, there's documentaries and stuff on that. It's, it's pretty cool. Um, it's almost like this stuff earlier, this, um, this is like the actual diagram for the stuff that they would, the process they would follow. It's kind of like tops almost in Houdini or something where you have like the scheduler assigning tasks and stuff. So I think my, um, is it like overexposure? It's like tone mapping where it like sets your, your white point or whatever. It's always hard to, to dial it in. Cause it's like not usually something you're uh i don't know used to changing <laughs> yeah i think the subsurface like what happened was i find i found a better thing it's more of like a pearl or an opal or something like that so it's an interesting combination of uh of luxury and and stuff like that so I'm going to save this new version. I'm going to try uh, doing some more blurring to this pass. Um, like I was saying, we could do pre and post um, blurring of the curvature field. So let's see what, let's just give it a try. Um, then we can do snapshots just to compare the two two different results i feel like the octane render buffer is better for doing that like they have the you could probably do it here i just don't know enough about how to set it up like the side by side uh wiping between the two so i don't know i think it's better with um more more detail sharper curvature 
maybe even less blurring to the source. See what happens here. Bottom right set AB. Oh, okay. And then I can do the cross. Very nice. It's like a photographer with his loop or the uh, magnifying glass. It's really, really inspecting the values. So I think with this uh, Jim Johnston, yo. So I think with that extra detail, it helps a little bit just uh, pepper in some, some subtle um, little, little things. This is very nice, actually. Uh, I'm enjoying this quite a bit. <laughs> Just need to spend some more time with this later on. Yeah, so it's, it's pretty similar to the nuke one or something. You could apply post effects, or this is, uh, that's from, from file or whatever, I think. Um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty nice. Yeah, so I basically, I reduced the blurring that I was doing to the, the VDB or the curvature, um, just to, to see what happened there. So I'm just going to, I'm getting close to finishing up. Um, I'm just going to play around with this actual curvature. I think Alex, he was talking about it earlier. I think he went to bed already, but um, see, he might see the VOD later on or something. So this one, you can get like high frequency curvature, basically. The um, reason I did the other range at VDB is because like to dial dial in those exact results, it's a, a bit harder to do with this render time curvature, um, like that stylized graphic looking thing. But then because this happens at render time, um, you can get very kind of sharp, like you just get more detail in it essentially. Um, so maybe something like that. Uh, and then, I don't know which, let's try these, these new Maxon noises. Um, if you put a noise into the radius, then you can get like crack, like cracking paint kind of look or something like that. Um, I think these frequency is going the other way than I thought it was. Um, let me just visualize my Maxon noise. These ones you have a ton of options, but I'm not, not always familiar with, with that many of them. So I might want to um, start with this overall scale as like a, yeah, the Maxon noises, I, <laughs> that was the biggest feature of, um, th of 3.0 for Redshift that I was excited about. There, um, whoops, what happened here? Uh, somehow I got my wrong number in my clipboard. Um, yeah, their default noises, like the generator or whatever, was a pretty bad, um, uh, node, I think. Like it just, the way that they were layering octaves and stuff like that wasn't, wasn't the best setup. So I'm just starting with, um, this value, like my constant value kind of. Um, yeah, it was just very frustrating to use, like to change the, to just essentially change the roughness of the noise. You have to change like three different sliders. It was like super, uh, <laughs> counterintuitive kind of, um, so 
I think with my output, maybe I'm just going to do the change range. Let me see what happens with this. So I basically just want to change the range like to very small numbers because our curvature radius is um, super uh, touchy, I guess. Like the, the radius is so small, we only want to modulate it by a, a very small amount. Like we're already kind of surpassing um, the radius and the noise value is like overtaking our, uh, our thing instead of just simply like moving it around a little bit. Let's try out. This one's a little weird. It's like a digital pattern. So this is more what I was looking for is like little specs and stuff like that. So I think right here, I want to go like really, I think it's just using the red channel. So I'm ignoring the other ones. Um, So it's looking good. <laughs> is it, so this is like another thing I'm going to use to modulate the blending, I think, so I can get like a little better detail kind of in the um, in the in the color mixing, essentially. So I don't know right now something. Uh, Something seems amiss. Let me just link these up. I think I need to change the time slider. That might change all, looks like it's reloading all the geometry. All right, we're back. Um, yeah, so with this one, I just want to get like really, really <laughs> fine features, basically, and, and then really like expand the radius for them. Um, I don't know, I, th I think my, uh, maybe it was this. All right, yeah. little polka dots, <laughs> little glints or something like that. Um, I think I'm still a bit too high with that value. So I think we're, we're getting better. All right. So we just have very, uh, this is what I mean doing this at render time, like you kind of have infinite detail that you can convert or, or play around with this value at. Um, let's just go into some of these other patterns now that we got the ranges and stuff. All right, that one could be nice. So I'm just going to take all of this over here. Um, and then can use this RS max and try it out. So that will just use the higher of the two values. Might, might have been going in the wrong range with it. So we might, instead of doing that, oh no, everything's broken. <laughs> Something, maybe I want min. All right, I think I just need to uh, reboot, refresh the render. 
sometimes when you just have too many, you're adding too many nodes and changes to the shader, it, it loses track of your uh, changes and stuff like that. Maybe I'll, I'll try the render region just to get like faster updates. So that's working. I think this guy is uh, where my problem lies. So I might just do another change range. Maybe it doesn't like, uh, I don't know, keeps losing my, my values. Do another refresh. One thing I, I could do if I was smarter is um, clip out this extra geometry. And then it would just be less like polygons and stuff like that to load all the time. I don't know if these values are just super uh, faint. Might, maybe I need to go to a color again. Um, let's try popping that in there. Oof. No, no, no. Doesn't like it. Um, this is a bit, I'm just gonna go out of the surface. It seems like that's working more, more uh, trustworthy. So I have, oof, forgot about that value already. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna do maybe the add. I, I think I just, like I was doing maximum at the start. I think that's the one I wanna do. Um, so do maximum of these two, put it in and refresh everything. So basically what I'm trying to do is like start with this blurry, uh, wide, uh, curvature range, and then using the noise expand or, or add, like it's, it seems like it's working now, um, add subtle little glints and stuff like that to it. So I might need to refresh. I don't know, it seems a bit, maybe with the cur curvature node, it's like not always uh, refreshing properly. It might also just be subtle enough that um, it's not coming over right. So I might do the Power at the end, a little bit less. See what happens. <laughs> this is already getting, uh, got carried away with stuff. It's, took, it's taking too long. Um, Yeah, I don't know, it's possible I need uh, another like kind of boost or something to this. Just like a contrast or something. Color correct. I feel like this is the big problem with Redshift right now, like they're their nodes and things like that aren't as uh, are directable or easy to to use. Just save that frame right there. Final. <laughs> It's better than, I feel like it's better than my final result. So, 
do this. <laughs> it looks like it's layering together better now. Um, change this level scale. I don't know. Let's see what happens. So I think that was the blend color I was using. Might just be too too subtle that like the subsurface stuff kind of blows it away. Um, Like those, that area is too too high frequency of a um, of a feature for things to, for it to pick up. All right. Let's see what happens here. Probably just gonna go with uh, whatever it gives me. So it's hard to say, but I think we're getting like a little bit of uh, of gold, little hints and stuff like that, like little veins almost. Um, I'm not going to get too too nitpicky with it. Um, I think one thing, like if I did, I'm kind of liking this the radius scale, but when I reduce that, I think my subsurface right now is um, like blowing that stuff out or taking it over pretty much. Um, I'm going to go back closer to where it was. Like if I, if I change the exposure, you could kind of see a little bit what I was, uh, hoping to do. Um, so we might want maybe reduce just like the, the intensity, uh, this diffuse weight also affects the, the subsurface. Um, so just reduce the white um, brightness of the that white material, the subsurface, and probably gonna leave it here. Got took a little longer than I wanted to today, but we got we got something cool out of it. Um, yeah, certain. Certain areas are better than uh, than others. So <laughs> you got to have a space. I think, yeah. <laughs> Easy clap. Um, yeah. So I'll just save this as another version. Um, and yeah, I think dialing the stuff in properly and, and everything like that could be pretty cool. There's other things like even just maybe changing this form, maybe a Taurus wasn't the, the best idea or whatever, but, um, it's just a, just a sketch, just a, oh, it should be one hour, but I, I don't know, was working more slowly and then just got caught up with, with other things. Um, yeah, I think right now the the next thing to do would be like breaking up some of these highlights, maybe doing a bump map or a, a noise or something like that to to push the detail, just add more more uh, variations so you could get in closer and everything. But we're gonna leave it here. Um, weekend, we we have the weekend schedule. We'll be back tomorrow one the same time. Um, we'll be going back into that PlayStation stuff. 
So I'm going to go and tweak um, some of the the setup so that it's not like changing spaces all the time or whatever. Um, like we were working on one axis and then rotating the world 90 degrees or whatever, and it was just getting too confusing. So I'm going to strip that out and simplify it. Um, and then I'm going to try to get those patterns working a little bit better, like the uh, when we were moving the X's and trying to replicate that stuff, it was just too high, too low, like frequency or not enough shapes and the, everything was like the, the scales were off. So fix scales, fix the uh, spaces. What time zone? It's the Pacific time zone. I don't know. There's like a daylight savings PDT and PST or whatever. Um, I believe it's PDT because it's during the, the summer for us or whatever. Um, we're getting the PS5 reveal. Yeah, so if you if you uh, didn't see that stream or whatever, it's the one, if you just go to my YouTube channel right now or the VODs, it's like the previous one before this from Wednesday. Um, there's scene files in the Discord too if you just want to pick up and, and play around with that stuff. Uh, that should be fun. So hopefully see you guys back tomorrow. Have a good Friday. Take it easy.